Hello, everyone. I am Scott Long, and I'm going to be talking about Thunderbolt on FreeBSD today for Virtual BSD CAN 2020. Uh, things we'll talk about is the history of USB, because uh, Thunderbolt is kind of an extension of USB. We'll talk about Thunderbolt itself, its relationship to FreeBSD and other operating systems, the status of the work that I've been doing for the last few months, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end. Uh, for those that I haven't met before, my name is Scott Long. I live in Colorado in the United States. And I've been involved in FreeBSD since uh, 1992 and been a committer since 2000 and have worked on a number of projects in the kernel, drivers, infrastructure, that kind of stuff. And I currently work at Intel. I've been there for about a year. Previously, I was at Yahoo, Netflix, and other places. So to get started with, um, we'll talk about USB a little bit because a lot of confusion has grown up around it, and it's important to understand USB in order to understand Thunderbolt. Um, USB started with the 1.0, 1.1 stuff back in the 90s. Uh, it was intended to, for low speed devices like keyboards and mice. Uh, there was a what they call a full speed mode that ran at 12 megabits per second, and that was meant for like uh, little webcams. And that also introduced the type A and type B connectors that we still use. Um, I've got some pictures off the side here, type A, type B. Should look pretty familiar, anyone that's used USB in the last uh, 20 years would know about it. Um, you know, uh, USB 2.0 came in in the early 2000s and bumped up to 480 megabits per second. It became a real challenger to Firewire. So with that, you could start doing uh, high quality video and um, multiple streams of audio at once. Um, about 2010-ish, USB 3.0 came out, uh, and that bumped up even further to five gigabits per second. And now you can start using USB as a real connection hub for all sorts of video. Um, then came USB 3.1 that introduced the Type-C connector that we're starting to see. I don't have a picture of her here yet, but um, the whole idea of Type-C was that uh, allow for higher, physically designed for, for higher bandwidth, carrying more power, and also getting rid of the whole problem of trying to flip your connector back and forth and figure out which way it's supposed to plug in. Because as we know, it takes three tries to plug in a two-way connector. Um, shortly after that came out, USB 3.2 is basically the same idea as USB 3.1, but it bumped up the speed even further to 20 gigabits by basically using two channels for data and bonding them together. It also bumped up the ability to deliver power to 100 watts so you could actually power your, your laptop. Um, off of USB. So uh, in there, there was also some name changing that happened. Uh, the USB uh, committee decided that USB 3.1 and 3.2 weren't descriptive enough, uh, and that USB 3.0 was even less descriptive. So they decided to change it all, and USB 3.0 became USB 3.1 Gen 1. As long as you're talking about USB 3.1. If you're talking about USB 3.2, then USB 3.0 became USB 3.2 Gen 1. And then they started differentiating the speeds by Gen 1, Gen 2, and Gen 2 by 2. So ultimately, you have um, Gen 1 is kind of a legacy speed of 5 uh, gigabits per second. Gen 2 is 10 gigabits per second. And Gen 2 by 2, not Gen 3 because that would be too easy, is uh, 20 gigabits per second. And then I started introducing all this branding, uh, labeling to try and give you an idea uh, from icons, what's going on. I don't know if it ever really helped because we still have connectors. And these are uh, USB-C connectors. And trying to figure out what, you know, USB-C has become this, this versatile interface for doing all sorts of different things. It can not only carry USB, but it can also carry display port. And as we'll see in a few minutes, can also carry Thunderbolt natively. So then they had, so then the USB committee came up with all these different uh, icons to, to show, you know, what's normal USB, what's super speed USB, what's super speed plus, what's super speed um, plus display port, uh, whether or not you can uh, do power delivery, uh, you know, basically power out from USB to your device to, to provide extra power or power in from your from the wall into your laptop to charge your battery. Um, and then there is this little Thunderbolt icon here that says it's actually does both USB and Thunderbolt. 
And you know what I found in, in trying to buy devices that are actually Thunderbolt compatible and compliant for doing my work is that um, most of the time the label that you see on the box in terms of saying that it's Thunderbolt or it's USB or whatever doesn't mean anything. Um, it, it's very misleading, very hard to figure out what you're actually getting. Uh, almost the, the best way to figure it out is by looking for these icons because those are copyrighted, trademark, whatever. And in order to use them, it actually has to be compliant with what you think it's supposed to be. So when we're talking about Thunderbolt, we're talking about ports that have this little Thunderbolt icon on them and can actually do native Thunderbolt as well as fall back to USB and other protocols that we'll talk about here in a few minutes also. So uh, what is Thunderbolt? Uh, it was developed kind of in parallel to USB 3 back in the uh, 2010s, uh, maybe even a little bit before that. It was primarily for Apple. Um, Thunderbolt 1 was 10 gigabits, just kind of, kind of like how USB 3.1 is 10 gigabits. Um, but it switched to different connectors, switched to this Thunderbolt connector, which I have up here uh, in the upper right. Um, I say it was primarily Apple. I don't know if there were any other major manufacturers that used it because it was it was a, a very much a, a licensed deal and um, Apple was very protective of it and wanted to keep it um, uh, a selling point for their their uh, laptops and computers. Um, but the big change about it, this was before USB-C even came out, was that uh, Thunderbolt connector can carry multiple protocols. It can carry um, USB-3, just like uh, USB, just like an A connector can. It can carry display port, and it can also carry just raw PCIe data. And what I mean by that is that it's basically like an external PCIe connector. And when you plug in something that is native Thunderbolt, quote unquote, it's actually communicating um, PCIe frames on the wire and treating your end device like it's a PCI device, like a plug-in card would be. Um, so then uh, things evolved a little bit, came out with Thunderbolt 2 that basically coupled speed kind of alongside with USB 3.2, you know, Gen 2 by 2, whatever. Um, and then came along Thunderbolt 3, uh, about 2015 or so. And that gives you 40 gigabits uh, they switched from using this kind of one-off Thunderbolt connector that only Apple was using to using a USB-C connector. And it became available on Intel PC platforms. Um, Intel was the manufacturer for the chips. Um, I don't know of anyone else that manufactured similar chips because I think uh, in terms of licensing and IP it was still considered to be relative, relatively proprietary. Um, but it started showing up on you know, Dell, HP laptops, you could buy it uh, as an adding card in the store. Um, and then lastly, USB 4 is on the horizon. And USB 4 is basically a, gen a, a evolution of Thunderbolt 3, where Thunderbolt 3 kind of really branched off from USB and started doing things its own way. USB 4 is, is really kind of more on that Thunderbolt branch and less on the main USB branch now. We'll talk about that too here in, in a minute. So what is Thunderbolt? Like I said, it's a technological successor to USB. Um, very high speed, but it can also deal with low speed things too. Has uh, legacy support for uh, USB 3 and USB 2. Uh, but the big difference is that it's a bi bi-directional protocol, whereas USB um, devices had to be pulled by the host in order to transfer data. Uh, with Thunderbolt, devices can transfer data whenever they want, as long as the switch topology has granted them access. Um, so in a lot of ways, it's, it's actually kind of like uh, Firewire, Firewire was, where Firewire gave you full access, uh, bi-directional access between the devices and the host. Thunderbolt's kind of the same thing. And, and you know, for the same reasons too, it's, it's more efficient and faster to have uh, the end devices be able to uh, control their own data transfers. Um, they can do it faster and with less resources from the host. Um, in USB pro, uh, speak, we had the idea of a hub and you know, basically a hub will allow you to fan out from one port coming into multiple, multiple ports coming out. And you could fan out to up to, I think, 127 devices, including your hub devices. In Thunderbolt, kind of the same idea, but it's called a switch or a router. Um, it, can, it can allow you to, fat, to fan out. Um, the only limitation is that you can have up to six hops, um, basically six switches in between your host and your final end device. 
Um, so really seven segments, six switches in between. Um, and that uh, is a limitation of the addressing. But from there, you can actually fan out. You can have chained uh, switches with, with their own fan outs. Um, that's not really as well supported in early Thunderbolt, but in, in later Thunderbolt and U2-4, I think it is well, better supported. Um, big difference is that these switches are much more intelligent. They can control bandwidth on a per port basis. They control the routing. Um, they can they can create virtual um, uh, connections between endpoints and allow or deny an endpoint to to transfer data or restrict the amount of data uh, bandwidth that it has available to it. Um, which you know is something that's actually very useful for a combined topology is using like DisplayPort and other devices. You want to make sure your DisplayPort tunnel has as much bandwidth as it can get, and that everything else is pushed off to the side. Um, part of the topology, like I said, is a device. A device is is something you plug in. It could be like a. Uh, give me a second here. I'll show one. It can be a. Uh, SSD drive like this. And in here, as you can see, I've got the Thunderbolt symbol on here. I don't know if you can see that well or not. Um, but this device contains a switch that has an upstream and a downstream port. Uh, the upstream faces up towards the host and downstream faces down towards its endpoints. And then it has an endpoint in it, which is the actual SSD hardware. This all looks like PCI Express to the host. Um, it doesn't look like USB. If I tried to plug this USB-C cable into a USB-only controller, it would basically do nothing. Um, I don't even think it would recognize it. it. Certainly wouldn't allow you to communicate on it. So, and then the final big component of Thunderbolt is this connection manager. And like I said, the, the switches are all configurable and it's necessary to configure them in order to transfer data. So the connection manager is that service that sits there and watches for uh, topology change events electrically and then turns those into switch configurations and notification of the host so that the host can then do hot plug. Um, in Thunderbolt itself, Thunderbolt 1, 2, and 3, the connection manager runs in a embedded processor in the controller silicon. Uh, it's relatively independent from the host OS. Um, there was an idea that would be completely independent, but that didn't work out. But it's it's basically running its own little thing. Um, with USB 4 and beyond, that has gone away, and the host is expected to manage that connection manager service and do all of the communication and setup of the switches itself. But for Thunderbolt, it's important to uh, communicate with that connection manager because there's handshaking that you have to do in order to uh, allowed devices to work. So when Thunderbolt was originally conceived, it was conceived as this, you know, primarily PCI Express, external PCI Express extension that could tunnel other things. And because it was PCI Express and all operating systems had PCI Express support in them, um, it required no special OS drivers. Um, you know, hot plug, Announcements would come from the, from the connection manager and be turned into PCI Express hot plug events or maybe ACPI hot plug events, uh, which once again, your host should be able to handle on its own without any, any special support. Um, all the switches look like PCI bridges. All the devices look like PCI devices. And your topology just looks like it's all PCI Express. So um, hosts wouldn't need to change anything. If, if a host could talk to you know, an NVMe drive or could talk to uh, maybe an Ethernet port, uh, you know, Ethernet controller that was all PCI Express, then they could talk over this and not care about it. Um, for legacy uh, USB devices, devices that don't talk native th Thunderbolt, the host controller for Thunderbolt contains a virtual XHCI controller in it. And when the downstream ports detect electrically that it's USB that they're being connected to and not Thunderbolt, then they'll instantiate this virtual XHCI controller and it'll pretend to the host like there's like you just plugged in an XHCI USB controller PCI device into the topology and then there's USB 3 devices behind it. And then the host just handles all of that as you know hot plug and US, normal USB. Um, 
And then DisplayPort would just pass through. It just, you know, plug in your video card to one side of the controller, plug in your monitor to the side of the controller, and everything just passes through and everything's hunky dory. So this was how it was supposed to work. Um, the reality, it did not hold up. And I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if just as things evolved with Apple, um, it kind of crept in or it was just flawed from the beginning or what. But um, a couple problems came up, which required there to be OS drivers. Number one is the Thunderbolt security model. Um, I've got a slide on that a little later to talk about that. But basically, there's this whole idea that um, Thunderbolt has a security model where it will prevent devices from being automatically presented to the host unless the host allows it. Basically, a pop-up window is supposed, to, is supposed to show up when you plug in a device and say, hey, this new SSD drive just got plugged in. Do you want to allow it to be connected? And you click yes, or you click no, um, or maybe you type in a password that uh, gets hashed and, and exchanged. Um, <clears throat> in order for that to work, obviously, you need a driver on your host that can talk to hardware and some demons or services that can manage those pop-ups and, and control those events. Now, the screen model can be disabled by the BIOS, but what you'll find when you, when you buy a lot of laptops, especially off the shelf, is that they have it turned on. If you don't know it's there, you don't know how to turn it off, you may try and plug in devices and they don't work. Um, second thing, which has been a big headache, is because Thunderbolt was originally aimed at Apple and at Apple laptops, there was an aggressive philosophy put towards power management. And all these nodes in the topology, these, these uh, endpoints and switches, they all get put into a low power mold, mode even when they're plugged in. And they really rely on the connection manager um, and the host waking them up and putting them into a normal power state so they can respond to normal PCI transactions. Um, I think the original thought was that the connection manager would do all of that. I, the reality seems to not be the case. And uh, you wind up needing the OS to both do power management wakeups on the host controller and on the downstream switches. Um, otherwise, you know, sometimes things will work, sometimes, you know, the things will kind of wake up on their own, maybe after a while, maybe after you, you plug in and unplug things enough times, or maybe reboot the, your laptop with things plugged in and have the BIOS do power management for you, but it becomes really chaotic. Um, worst case scenario is that, um, a device, an endpoint will, uh, kind of come up, wait for a command from the host for power management to stay up, it won't get it, and it'll come back down, and then it'll come back up a few uh, hundred milliseconds later and get this flapping effect. And the host will just keep on seeing all these hot plug events and not be able to respond to them because every time it does, it's not doing what the device is expecting. Um, and then finally, display port, um, there was a need for manual configuration of uh, quality of service for bandwidth. Um, oh, and uh, there's also this idea of a raw frame mode. So I've been talking about native Thunderbolt, and what I really mean is, uh, devices showing up as PCI Express devices. There's an even more low level format, which is this raw frame mode where you can basically send raw datagrams between nodes and do things with that and basically build up your own protocol. And one thing that's been done at Apple and Linux and um, I don't know anyone else is this thing called Thunderbolt IP where you can basically encapsulate uh, an ethernet style frame in onto the wire and treat Thunderbolt as a network interface, um, which is actually really cool because it means that you can build a 40 gigabit network in your basement using relatively cheap hardware. I mean, a, a Thunderbolt card is you know maybe $100 at most, usually about 50 bucks. The cables are relatively cheap. Um, and it's all very easy to plug together and, and configure versus a 40 gigabit uh, network card is gonna be you know, a few hundred dollars, maybe more. And you guys start thinking about um, expensive cabling and switches, all that kind of stuff. So I uh, talked about the Thunderbolt security model, uh, go a little bit more into it. Um, there's four modes that are kind of, that were originally part of the Thunderbolt spec. First one is this no security mode where this, the, uh, once you plug a device in, um, once again, we're talking native Thunderbolt devices, this doesn't apply to USB devices that you plug in because um, for whatever reason, they felt that, you know, USB wasn't going to be a threat vector, I guess, since USB doesn't expect to be able to be bi-directional bus mastering. But for native Thunderbolt devices, uh, you can have no security, and that basically 
means the connection manager will always automatically set up a, a connection between the endpoints of the device and the host and notify the host of the hot plug event. Second is this user, user security. And this is kind of the this was kind of the default mode of operation that a lot of uh, cards and laptops shipped with. And that's where um, whenever a device is plugged in, the connection manager will send a message to the host driver and say, hey, I just got a device connected and you need to approve it. And then it's up to the host driver to then tap a, to, to send a message to maybe a daemon or a, uh, or, you know, a service in Windows or in Mac OS or whatever, and um, put a pop-up window and say, this, you know, device, this uh, SSD was just connected with a serial number. Do you want to allow it? And then you hit yes. And then uh, the host then sends a response message back to the connection manager that says approved. And then the connection manager can finishes setting up the routing and then gives a formal hot plug event to the host. There was a third method, which is kind of a modification of the second, which involves a pre-shared key and a challenge response um, between the host and the device on these pre-shared keys, combining a, a password from the user. Um, I think there's support for this in Linux. There's definitely support for this. Um, well, I don't even know if there's support for this in, in, in Mac. But the idea was is that um, instead of just being able to blindly hit OK, approve, you'd, be able, you'd have to uh, plug in the password in order to approve something. And maybe you didn't know the password, or maybe the uh, password just slowed, you, slowed down your fingers long enough to actually think about, you know, is this really something safe to plug in or not? Um, and then the final method is this display port only method, which was the idea that if your screen is connected through a Thunderbolt hub uh, over DisplayPort and all your videos going that way. You're going to need to at least have your screen working and automatically authenticated in order for your computer to work. So let's let's have this DP only mode where DisplayPort is automatically authenticated. Everything else is this user authentication mode. Um, so long-winded way to say that there were these different modes. The OS need to know about them, but in reality, this was all useless because you know, people train themselves to always hit OK to a prompt anyway. You know, I, anyone that uses a, a Mac or Windows machine, if you if you pull out a USB thumb drive unexpectedly, it'll give you a prompt saying, hey, you should have done that. Well, what do you do? You just hit OK. Um, you know, likewise, people in the security community know that it's very easy to convince someone to hit the OK button, uh, you know, through social engineering or just, you know, they just want something to work, so they're just going to hit OK. So this model was deemed to be pretty much useless. Um, and in fact, it's been removed from USB 4 entirely. And even in some of the later generation USB 3 stuff, it's kind of deprecated. So um, with all that background about USB out of the way, uh, let's talk about, uh, well, USB and Thunderbolt. Let's talk about Thunderbolt 3 and FreeBSD. So number one, I'm only talking about Thunderbolt 3. Thunderbolt 1 and 2 were very much Mac specific. I couldn't find any hardware out there that wasn't a uh, Apple piece of hardware that uh, supported USB 1 or 2. And since you know, FreeBSD doesn't really run all that great on older Macs um, or Mac laptops, and it can, but it's not great, uh, I chose to limit the scope to just Thunderbolt 3 because Thunderbolt 3 is available for a wider range of hardware. You can go out to a... Uh, Best Buy or shop online, get a Thunderbolt card, plug it in. A lot of laptops have it. Um, Dell, HP, IBM, they all come uh, with those ports built in. So like I said, limited to Thunderbolt 3 for now. Um, I started working at Intel about a year ago. One of my goals was to write a Thunderbolt 3 driver. Um, but at the time, the specs were all kept pretty tight within the company. It was all considered to be trade secrets, uh, joint deals with Apple. They didn't want to let anything out. Um, they had done a Linux driver, but they had, they were specific about it. since it's GPL. We, you know, GPL, we don't want there to be any, any cross contamination between GPL and other licenses. So you're not allowed to look at that driver. But in August um, of 2019, the USB 4 spec was released to the public by the USB SIG. And that contained a lot of the foundational bit of information on how things worked that 
also is shared by Thunderbolt 3. So it gave a good starting point for figuring out what's going on on the covers. Um, so with that released and the fact that um, it was becoming an inevitability that there was going to be more open source interest in uh, Thunderbolt 3 and USB 4, I got the go ahead to start working on a FreeBC driver in 2019 while I was at Intel. And through that, I was able to actually get access to some of the internal specs and documents on Thunderbolt 3 and some of the internal workings of the connection manager, um, all that kind of stuff. The goal of this project was, like I said, to write a clean room, unencumbered Thunderbolt 3 and USB 4 stack, uh, to not use any GPL code as a code reference. Um, because Intel, like I said, was you know, very, very sensitive to uh, USB, to uh, GPL being a bit of a contaminating source. Um, so it was very important that I had access to some of those docs. Um, unfortunately, two months later, Intel abandoned the project and abandoned the entire team, and I got reassigned to a completely different project. So I was able to get some work done in that time. Um, luckily, the FreeBC Foundation has stepped up and has offered to sponsor continuing work to see this done. So that's uh, kind of the framework of where things are at. Um, I've got the driver in progress right now. It's in GitHub. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but there's basically uh, several components I have done right now. Um, I'm calling it Thunderbolt uh, because honestly, it's not really USB anymore. You know, USB really stops at USB three. There is this you know SysDev USB directory that has the host controller uh, source files and a bunch of peripheral source files, all that kind of stuff. And that's great. And that will continue to exist as is. But really USB 4, you know, when all this work becomes USB 4, it's not gonna look anything like the previous USB code did. So there really didn't make sense to try and shove it into the existing USB directory. Better to keep it separate, uh, basically kind of view it as a, as a fresh start, just like Intel and Apple did when they're developing, developing the technology. Um, components in there, there's a module called NHI that stands for New Host Interface. I don't know where that name came from. It just kind of started to exist at some point. It's kind of analogous to uh, OHCI, XHCI, all that kind of stuff with uh, USB, where it's the it's kind of the interface for doing communication down the bus. Um, there's this other module called NHI, NHI WMI, and that's for mainly corner control. We'll talk about that here in a bit. Um, then there's the PCI bridge driver, and it's basically a super class of the normal PCI bridge driver. And I needed that because I need to be able to access registers and do power management of the, of the Thunderbolt bridges that were in the host controller and not down the, not down the line. Um, and then there's the TV module. That's the main module that is responsible for communicating to the uh, connection manager, passing messages back and forth to approve devices and get topology. And down the road, that's also going to be basically the module that has the host con communication or host connection manager in it that does all that work itself. I and mean, the last module is TV debug. Um, spent a bit of time on that. So I mentioned that because I found the spec was so big and there's so many things going on in terms of registers and bit fields and messages that it was good to spend some time doing a dedicated debug uh, tracing module that did uh, parsing and uh, string expansion of registers and all that kind of stuff. So I'll talk about that too. Um, NHI, like I said, new host interface. Um, its basic job is to present a bunch of DMA rings to the host for the host to then put messages on those rings and communicate with various parts of the topology. Uh, DMA ring zero, is dedicated to talking to the connection manager that's in the that the embedded connection manager and also talking to the switches downstream as well. Um, you can have up to, I think, 12 rings, uh, maybe even 16 rings. Uh, each ring has its own uh, uh, MSIX interrupt. Those other rings can be used for uh, talking, speaking raw frames to other endpoints, basically doing the Thunderbolt IP. I talked about. Um, that's not implemented right now. Only ring zero is implemented right now because that's all that's needed in order to do configuration. Um, and one thing I should mention too is that when we talk about um, devices being connected and communication all that kind of stuff, the only thing that these drivers are responsible for is configuration. Actual data movement happens 
uh, basically transparent to the host. If I if I connect that SSD drive, I'm not having to go through the uh, NHI driver or any of the PCIe drivers in order to actually pass in visual commands and, and data frames. It all happens as if you basically tunneled. Basically, the, the host driver sees a PCIe device that's NVMe and communicates it to it as if it was just a normal PCIe device. All the, encapsul all the encapsulation through the topology happens in the hardware and the host doesn't need to be aware of it. So it's not like I need to use these DMA rings for encapsulating my data for a, for a disk drive or for an Ethernet controller or anything like that, or even USB. These are just for doing outband communication and for doing this low level um, frame exchange for doing like your, your own home roll Ethernet. Um, NHA WMI. So WMI stands for Windows Management Interface. Um, apparently that over the last 20 years has grown into this monster configuration layer in Windows that allows you to do all sorts of evil things between the user and the OS and the hardware. And um, we can use it to wake up the Thunderbolt controller if it's falling asleep, um, <laughs> which is actually kind of convenient for debugging because otherwise um, you have to do manual hot plugging to wake things up and manually manage your registers and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I include it because uh, as I talk about it a little bit, um, some of the older Thunderbolt hardware is actually really, really weird to deal with. It doesn't show up the way on, that you think it should on the bus. So this WMI module is kind of a, a secret backdoor to kind of make things wake up, turn on, and show up the way you, you expect them to. Um, Thunderbolt PCIB driver. That's a super class of the existing PCIB drivers. There's a normal variant and an ASPI variant. Um, and these are necessary because there's a lot of registers on these Thunderbolt switches that are available over PCI uh, registers that are needed to be manipulated for power management. And if we don't do that, then we wind up with this topology that gets flaps up and down, on and off, doesn't stay stable. Um, so basically, I have to intercept that uh, the PCI bridge that gets hot plugged in via the topology, and then go around these backdoor registers and tell it to, yeah, actually do power yourself up and stay up and power up all your child stuff too. Um, the other nice thing is that because it's a, a super class uh, using new bus, I can basically change the names of things and it doesn't show up as just a normal PCIe bridge, it shows up as a Thunderbolt bridge. So when you're doing like D message or PCI comp or something like that to see what's in your system, you can because these are overridden as a super class, you can actually see what's what's normal PCI Express and what's Thunderbolt. Um, then there's the TV module. Like I said, that's its job is to uh, do the message passing uh, and topology management with the firmware connection manager firmware that is on the on the uh, controller, and eventually it'll be doing the full connection manager duties. Uh, for USB 4. Um, basically what happens for it is that when the NHI, NHI device is initialized, it'll pass up to the TB layer and the TB layer will send a driver ready message to the connection manager in the firmware. Uh, connection manager will then come back with a bunch of device connected messages that uh, basically enumerate everything that it knows about on the bus at that time. And if anything, is in that uh, user uh, approved state for security, then a bit will be set and, and the connection manager will wait for us to send back an approved PCI message uh, to say that it's okay for that, uh, that device to come online. Um, alongside all these device connection messages, so these are basically just informational for the driver. Um, once things are approved either automatically or via the approved PCI message coming from the host, then the connection manager will also generate PCI Express hot plug events to the uh, to the host bridges, and then those will be handled via normal uh, PCI Express machinery that we already have in FreeBSD. Um, big TBD piece, like I said, we got to move all the connection manager logic out of the firmware and into the host. Um, basically, we we have to be able to talk to several different layers of devices inside the host switches to be able to talk to um, ports themselves, the actual router 
uh, piece inside of uh, up above that. Um, and basically, we've got to be able to get hot plug messages from the from the ports that say electrically I just saw something, and then turn that into um, a, a routing table in the router to say you know this endpoint needs to be able to communicate with these other endpoints. Um, yeah. So, and then the last thing that, that the TV has is a system tool tree for device management information. I'll show that here in a few minutes when I switch over to a live demo. Um, and lastly, there's this TV debug module. It's very similar to what I implemented for the uh, LSI, SAS drivers, NPR and NPS. Um, but basically it makes it very easy to uh, provide multiple debug levels as a bit mask and multiple intensity levels for those debug levels. So um, you can specify no debugging, minimal debugging, normal debugging, or heavy debugging. Um, basically, that that allows you to then select how verbose your your tracing and walking is from the driver. I also have a bunch of string lookup tables in there too, that automatically um, decode bit fields in in registers and uh, message structures and all that kind of stuff coming from the hardware. So it just makes it a lot easier to see what's going on when you're trying to debug something. You can turn all that on and see not only what the data, what the bits are, but what they mean without having to go uh, open up a spec to do it too. Um, so that's the driver. Uh, going back and talking about the host hardware itself, stuff that you can get your hands on right now to test this out with. Um, there's three different classes of hardware you can buy. One's called Alpine Ridge. That's the most common. That's been in a laptop since about 2016. And in fact, it's still in a lot of laptops being sold right now. Um, it comes in either one or two port variants. A port, like I said, is basically like a USB port. It's, 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 it's a head point for a chain that you can then connect multiple things onto. Um, and also does display port 1.2. Um, I think that only matters if you're doing like Dual monitors or the like the high resolution 5K monitors. Uh, display from 1.2 can't do that, but I think you can do 4K monitors. Um, that silicon, the Alpine Ridge silicon, is available as a standalone ASIC. Um, so you can buy it as a PCI Express card off of Newegg. Um, it's available as a separate ship in a bunch of laptops. Um, from a driver standpoint, it contains the version one of the connection manager interface. And I'll talk about that in a little bit because that's kind of annoying. Um, Titan Ridge was the successor to Alpine Ridge. The only big difference is that it supports DisplayPort 1.4, so higher bandwidth. You can do dual monitors with it or 5K monitor with it. Um, it's also a standalone A6, so you can buy it as an add-in card. What I've seen is that typically an Alpine Ridge card costs about 60 bucks, um, whereas a Titan Ridge card costs about $100. And the only real difference between the two is this DisplayPort attribute of it. Um, so I haven't actually put support into the driver yet for Titan Ridge because I haven't bought a card yet. But in theory, it should just be a matter of adding some PCI, uh, uh, some PCI IDs to the driver and saying some flags that say what kind of uh, interface it is. Um, as I hint here, there's a version two of the connection manager interface, uh, which is also really annoying. And then uh, the last big class you can buy is Ice Lake. That's the uh, Intel Gen 10 chipset, although there's a whole conversation we had over what Intel is calling Gen 10. And, you know, Gen 10 can, is different, is several different CPUs and chipsets right now. And only one of them, the Ice Lake Gen 10, actually contains the Ice Lake Thunderbolt hardware. Anything else probably contains Alpine Ridge. Um, big change for Ice Lake is that this was Intel's attempt to kind of converge what it had done with Thunderbolt with, with what the USB SIG was morphing Thunderbolt into for USB 4. So it's kind of a bridge between the way Thunderbolt looks from a from a topology standpoint and the way um, or the way I'm sorry the way USB 4 looks from a topology standpoint and the way that things operate from a connection manager standpoint being embedded. So kind of a bridge between the two. Anyway, my driver supports that. Um, and then down the line at some point, you know, Intel Gen 10, I'm sure AMD and uh, others will come out with USB 4 silicon here before long because the spec has been out for almost a year now. I keep on hearing rumors of like the end of 2020 or beginning of 2021, you'll have native USB 4 controllers out there. Um, those USB 4 controllers will be able to talk to both um, USB 3 devices or Thunderbolt 3 devices as well as USB 1, 2, and 3 devices. 
Um, so let's also talk about security in FreeBSD. Um, about a year, year, or maybe two years ago, a group in Cambridge released a paper called Thunderclap where they, they trace through just how insecure the Thunderbolt uh, data model is and how you can plug in a road device into your laptop and have it completely take control over your laptop, stealing data out of memory, um, I think even controlling other devices if you want to. Um, and what they really pointed out was that the Thunderbolt stream model is useless and that um, even it's possible even when you say no to a security prompt with Thunderbolt, it's possible still to bypass things and, and still get access to at least a host controller and um, wreak havoc from there. So the the uh, Thunderbolt screen model was removed entirely from the USB 4 spec in response. Um, my response in the driver will be that um, all device insertions will be automatically acknowledged with device connects. You can turn that off with the tunable. Um, and if it's certainly possible to do like what Linux does with um, with Dbus and do the same thing with DevD, you know, pipe a message from the driver through DevD to user land and have a, a daemon or a script listing for that and, and providing a, a challenge response to the operator. Uh, I'm not working on that, but if you want to work on that, that's, you know, that's great, but it's really kind of a dead end technology wise. Um, the real thing that needs to happen is for FreeBSD to make sure that the IOMU is set up to uh, isolate everything coming through the through the Thunderbolt port, um, isolate it to a to a, a, a safe uh, memory range, you know, a safe isolated memory range, and then make sure that all the drivers, whether it's a NVMe uh, driver or Ethernet driver, or whatever, is also using the IOMU correctly to. Uh, do DMA through that safe isolated range. Um, so now the fun part, let's talk about difficulties and just how uh, how infuriating this hardware has been at times. Um, so we've got things like uh, the Alpine Ridge and Titan Ridge controllers start out as being invisible, because like I said, they're in this aggressive power down state, so powered down that they don't even respond to PCI config accesses. Um, so when you, when you first plug in your uh, your Alpine Ridge card or your Alpine Ridge laptop and like run PCI comp to see what's there, um, it won't show anything there, nothing at all. And, you, and you'll be kind of scratching your head. And then suddenly, you know, you plug in a USB dongle or you plug in a native Thunderbolt device. And suddenly there's this flurry of pop up events and the controller, all the bridges show up, your end device shows up suddenly. And now the drivers, now the host has to go through and, and quickly catch up to all of that, make sure that everything's configured in line as it comes in. Um, but it makes it hard to do things like, you know, pre-configure uh, through the CTLs, how a device is, gonna, is going to operate. Uh, and it makes it really hard to just kind of do a normal inventory of your system and see what's there and what's not there. Um, and it really confused me for the first week or two. I, you know, I had this laptop that had Thunderbolt 3 on, on the box, but there were no Thunderbolt 3 PCI IDs in it. Um, and I would go and I would plug in a USB dongle. And I would still get no Thunderbolt IDs because once again, things behave differently on hot plug and um, plug in a USB 3 dongle into a Thunderbolt port and it says, oh, you just want to talk to USB 3. We don't need any, any of this communication stuff and security configuration, all kind of stuff. So we're just not gonna power up the NHI device. And we're just gonna treat this as like it was a PCI bridge and a USB controller. But, oh, by the way, that still doesn't work quite right because we still require you to do all this power management wake ups on the bridge device. So that really forced me to rethink my travel model. I'd originally come into this project thinking that NHI was gonna be just like XACI. It's gonna be this all in one, uh, device and one driver would do everything that you need to do. And what I realized is that really Thunderbolt is a PCI bridge. They have to have this NHI thing off the side for doing some side band configuration stuff. But really you need to view it as a PCI bridge that's special. Um, but even then it's painful because these PCI bridges where you have to do side channel um, registers to control power management. There's no way to, to tell which is an upstream port or downstream port. Every 
every device has has actually two bridges on it. It has an upstream port facing upwards towards the host and has a downstream port facing downstream towards its devices, other imports or, or other things down the chain. And there, there's just a, 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 a PCI bus in between. But when you plug it in, you can't tell which is upstream, which is downstream, um, not by the PCI ID. So you actually have to go and look at topology and look at, at parent-child relationships to figure out which is upstream, which is downstream. And then only send the correct power management registers to the correct upstream or downstream port, which are different. Um, so that was a lot of fun to do too. Um, you know, I think Linux does a whole, basically Linux does treat the NHI driver as being the, the, the source of truth for everything. And it manually walks through PCI topology and manually goes fumbling around in other devices, register spaces. Um, I try to make it a lot more clean abstract and like I said, super classing the, uh, the PCI v uh, bridges, having to be able to figure out uh, parent-child relationships and figure out their kind of what they do from those relationships. Um, another big headache, uh, like I mentioned, with Alpine Ridge versus Titan Ridge, is that the connection manager uh, communication interface is unversioned, but the same message number has different structure representations between uh, Alpine Ridge, Titan Ridge, and Ice Lake. So you can get a device connected message, but its structure contents are gonna be different depending on what kind of hardware you're on. So um, that requires you, or that required me to basically duplicate a lot of code. You know, I'm getting this device connected message. Okay, well, this was, this came in on an Alpine Rich controller. So I'll, I'll send it over to this function versus the Tenrich controller send it over to this function. But really both functions are doing almost the same thing. They just are dealing with vastly different structures. Um, I tried doing things like using a union to put both message types together into the same overall structure union, um, but that didn't work because the messages were different sizes at times um, and you didn't want there to be any potential problems with assigning the wrong amount of memory to a, a message type and you know being open to overwriting or corrupting things. Um, and then all this, like I said, uh, with Alpine Ridge, Titan Ridge, everything before, Thunderbolt was really a PCI bridge buses and this NHI thing off the side. And you have to treat it as such with PCI bridge being kind of the, the master device of the topology. Then isolate comes along and in following lines with what the USB SIG want to do with USB 4, suddenly that's flipped up around and now the NHI device is kind of the master device and has bridges underneath it. So all this work I had done to redo my model and, and how topology works and understand parent-child relationships between devices that I done for Alpine Ridge, I had to completely uh, turn around for Ice Lake. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Anyway, so uh, we're actually almost uh, out of time. So driver status, uh, the layers I talked about that were pretty much done other than these and cleanup. Uh, the only thing that's missing is power management for the external switches. So if you have a chain set of devices, the, those chain devices don't do their own power management and can wind up not working very well. Um, big problem that I have right now though is code release. Since this was started under Intel using Intel docs, I still need to go through an Intel approval process to release it. Right now the code's in a private GitHub repo. Um, I do expect to have this done relatively soon, but things like COVID, starting a new job, all kind of stuff has slowed this down. Um, so I don't have an ETA yet, but hopefully it's relatively soon. So, and then I talk about future work. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, Thunderbolt. I'm going to stop sharing, and I think it's time to switch over to Q and A. Oh, I got a message from Dan. I can go as long as I want. Um, well, you know, what, let me screen share again then. Share my whole desktop. Um, I've got two laptops I use as my primary testing platform. One is a 2016 Dell XPS 13. One is a 2020 Dell XPS 13. Um, one is an Alpine Ridge. One has a Ice Lake. So uh, we can do things like PCI conf l v. Um, you can see 
like right here, Thunderbolt Bridges. Uh, in this, on this laptop, I actually have a docking station which acts as a second, uh, a second layer switch and set of endpoints. Um, I have the uh, NVMe device that I showed that I held up. Um, that, uh, but that thing also has a uh, this other this, uh, express card reader, which is also a native Thunderbolt device built in as an endpoint into this docking station I have. Um, this XHCI control right here was actually is actually a child of the docking station and it comes through as tone USB via that virtual XHCI controller that I talked about. So if I don't have this, uh, if I don't have that, that uh, the docking station plugged in, I don't get this at all. Um, but then up here at the top, you can see some other Thunderbolt switches um, basically PCI bridges, and I've got the uh, NHI devices here. Because it's dual port, there's two devices. That's kind of a new thing for, for um, Ice Lake as well, uh, versus like Alpine Ridge, you'll have like one device, but it'll have two ports internally to it. Um, over here on my older Dell, if I do PCI conf, I'm just gonna do LLB compact here. Um, You'll see there's actually nothing there that looks like Thunderbolt or NHI or anything like that. I actually have to plug something in. So what I'll first do is actually I'll do um, I'll do the NHI WMI. Let's see if I can remember how to do it. So NHI WMI do force power equals one. Oops, sorry, I'm going to check zero force power. And of course, I need to be root to do that. And then suddenly I'll have a bunch of stuff to show up. And now I've had some extra piece of bridges show up here and this NHI device show up here. I still don't have anything plugged in. Um, I could plug in a USB thing and have it show up. I could plug in this SSD as well, but um, it's going to be problematic because, like I said, the downstream uh, downstream switch power management isn't in yet, so it's going to actually show a lot of uh, configuration errors and and kind of flapping when it happens. So, anyway, just quick demo. Um, but otherwise, you know, I can do I/O to everything in the topology, whether it's USB or it's um, you know, an SSD is not a native thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's getting really close, and hopefully, I'll have it checked in relatively soon. So, with that, I will stop sharing my screen again. And um, Q and A. How do we want to do Q and A? Let's scroll back through your to the channel. We can scroll back through the channel and see if there are any questions. I was not. Oh, I, there we go. I, I wasn't watching the channel at all. Okay. That's okay. I'm scrolling back now. Okay. All right. So scrolling back, I'm just going to kind of go through stuff as I saw it here chronologically. Okay. So they just stop for ruining the buffer. Yeah, so I apologize for being a live stream and not a pre-recorded stream. I know that was kind of problematic for people, um, but uh, you know, it's been a tough couple of months here. So trying to get things going has been slow. Uh, let's see here, um, T Thunderbolt's new fireware. Yeah, kind of it is. And I talked about that. DMA exploits talked about that. Um, Thunderclap and all that. Um, and yeah, Thunderbolt or Ethernet Warner was asking about that. Um, that'd be really cool because, like I said, it'll allow people to experiment with high speed networking at home, both for development purposes and also for you know, being able to back up to fast SSDs um, outside the box. Uh, let's see here.
Okay, question. Um, what happens with Ethernet stuff? Well, Paul Henning was thinking was asking about. Um, so I talked with Paul Henning about a month ago. He was having problems because his um, his USB dongles or his Ethernet dongles were USB, and it was running into the problem of power management and and all the switches not being fully powered up. Um, I gave him a preview of my driver, and I think that helped. I don't think it solved things entirely because once again, still need to write this whole connection manager thing to control downstream switches. Um, but I think it helped. Um, but that is not the same as Thunderbolt IP raw frames. Um, and if someone came up with a a true uh, native Thunderbolt PCI dongle that wasn't just uh, USB, but was true PCI Express uh, communication over Thunderbolt frames, then that may work a little bit better. Um, someone's asking if there's not an Intel Thunderbolt. Uh, my understanding is that no, that all Thunderbolt was developed exclusively between Apple and Intel. Yeah, Intel's the one who was making Silicon um, up until Thunderbolt 3 and Alpine Ridge. I think Apple was the only one that was buying the Silicon. Um, but USB 4 is opening all that up. It's an unencumbered free to use spec. So I would expect that. Uh, you know, future generation of AMD laptops and, and other devices are going to be USB 4. Uh, someone's asking how dangerous is Thunderbolt with IO MMU enabled? Um, you know, there's a, a big write up on the Thunderclap website from the researchers from Cambridge about that. Um, basically, you can protect against most things. I think there's still a few cases that are hard to protect against. I'll be interested to see how USB 4 evolves to to um, address that. You know, my mandate is to um, make sure that uh, the IOMMU is being used correctly by all the drivers that we care about in terms of USB, uh, NVMe, and, um, you know, who knows what else, to make sure everyone's talking the same way uh, through the IOMMU, basically using bus EMA correctly so that the uh, IOMMU can protect as well as it can against that. Um, Warner is asking, do we have the ability to Wireshark raw TV packets? Uh, I want to say qualified yes when that comes around because, um, you know, in one sense, there's no reason not to make that be a if lib driver at the front end. You know, still, you know, talking to you, uh, Thunderbolt on the back end, but if lib on the front end, and if lib has normal BPF hooks in it, so you should be able to buy a shark from that. Um, I say qualified because I haven't really thought much about what it means for things like IOM, IOM, security and all that kind of stuff. Maybe it means nothing, uh, but um, but I, I guess I, I'm just talking about Thunderbolt IP. If you want to talk about uh, wire sharking raw TV packets, um, you know, that may be something where we need to look at uh, whether D-Trace can do that well enough. I don't know if it makes sense to build in a dedicated uh, kind of tap interface into that or just rely on D-Trace to be able to do that for you. Or if maybe that's a project for like EBPF and having EBPF, EBPF be kind of the all seeing all dancing Wireshark back end for everything down the line. Um, question, could Thunderbolt replace FireWire for kernel debugging? Um, yes, as long as you are willing to open up the ILM mute to access all kernel memory. Um, I haven't really given much thought about that, but um, that may be something to think about. So I'll make a note of that, that that, that could be interesting. Um, Warren was asking, Pipe Dream, can I use my old TV2 sleepboard monitor with this? Um, you should be able to, because it's all display port. There are connector dongles that go between Thunderbolt 2 and Thunderbolt 3 slash USB-C. I haven't tried any of that yet. Um, one thing I didn't mention, I've really kept Thunderbolt, or I've really kept display port out of my uh, work so far because that's, if you look at the USB 4 spec, about half of it is all display port knobs and state machines and all, all sorts of stuff. So I just have not focused on that at all yet because it's a big topic. Um, but in theory, since Thunderbolt 2 display port is just display port, conversion dongle should work. Um, yeah. Uh, Wouldn't a single non IOMU driver in the kernel be enough to take over the system? Um, yes, yes, it would. So yeah, we need to think about that and think about, you know, should there be some sort of a whitelist authentication mechanism, whitelist or blacklist authentication mechanism um, 
So yeah, that's a big, big deal. Uh, I think at first we're just going to say, you know, these devices, these drivers are kind of certified for safe use with the IOMU and anything that's not on the list is not certified, don't use it. Uh, but yeah, down the line, we should probably think about um, not only doing a sweep of the tree and make sure everything is compliant, but also having the kind of whitelist, blacklist system um, that uh, helps protect against the future. Uh, another question I missed, uh, will chain displays or Thunderbolt be supported? Once again, uh, yeah, DisplayPort, I haven't really thought much about it. My understanding is that with DisplayPort 1.2 and Alpine Ridge, you can only do one 4K display. Uh, you can't do two 4K displays, uh, but I think you can chain two like uh, 1080p displays. So I don't know. All right. Um, while well, we are, are discussing uh, IOMUs, one thing I didn't really touch on in the slides, or they were there, but I didn't mention it, was that even though this is a very different code base from USB, I think there is a lot of value in having it use the same with USB API and possibly even USB config because it still mixes USB devices with Thunderbolt devices. And from a user, uh user experience i think it makes a lot of sense that users shouldn't have to care about what libraries and tools are using um and you know whether or not it's usb or thunderbolt when they plug it in so that is part of the work that I've, i'm doing with the foundation is also looking at what it's going to take to make with usb be a little more expanded and work with the thunderbolt framework as well Um, you know, and I'll just talk about uh, disabling the IOMU for GDB. You know, I remember 10, 15 years ago, it was a thing to use FireWire to debug with, uh, to do uh, your remote GDB. Um, you know, question I have for you guys is that, is that still a thing? I mean, you can still give FireWire controllers out there. Do people actually buy FireWire controllers within their system for doing remote GDB? Um, you know, is that something that people really miss or is that just kind of a nice to have? All right, well, if there are any other questions, I think I'm going to yield my time. Thank you guys very much. Um, this has certainly been an interesting time for doing presentations. Um, and I really thank Dan and Alan and everyone else, all the volunteers that have been putting this on. Uh, this all went, you know, really, really well considering. So, um, Dan, I think that's it for me.